Huh? On the cloud, I am recording it on the cloud. Okay, excellent. So maybe uh, uh, you do the introduction, Akif. Okay. Okay, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, wait, wait, so, so I'm sorry, should I share my screen before Akif's introduction? Yeah, uh, that's sure. a good idea. Yeah, that will be. Should we wait for, I mean... Maybe five minutes more, let's wait. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, because I think uh, there will be... Uh, who was, I couldn't remember. There was Berk, Berk. I couldn't remember his name, but he was regular. Who, who is he? Uh, let me check. Semi is Semi is on the way. Darkan uh, is not here. Darkan is not here. Uh, well, his uh, thesis uh, defense is getting very close. He may be typing furiously his thesis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So should we wait for him or? Um, uh, Larkan, or will he come? He will join, I mean, if he shows. Okay, then. Maybe. <clears throat> okay. Uh, by the way, I couldn't ask <laughs> one. Uh, yes. What time is it? I mean, is it, is it too early there? Or? <laughs> it should ah, be 11. No, it's it's eleven eleven yeah, a.m. Oh, okay. so it's perfect time. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Yeah, I had a um, I had a bit of a busy uh, week, couple of weeks last week, so I was just um, finishing some things, and it was the perfect time actually at eleven. <laughs> that time to wake up early and finish them, and <laughs> so yeah, it was. Yeah. Thank you very much for um, for waiting until seven p.m. In, in oh no, that's perfectly yeah. fine for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, Akif, is uh, Juan in our higher structures mailing list? Uh, I don't think so, but we can add yeah, I mean, no. this, the list. Is uh, I think it's it's with you uh, <laughs> as far as I know. Oh, uh, Semi right? is busy with. Uh, ah, Semi. Ah, okay. So yeah. I will uh, tonight. I will call him and. Yeah, I can send you. I mean, if it's okay. I can send Juan's email to you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea. So I, I got I got the message from Akif of uh, Urs Schreiber's talk. I think it was a couple of months ago. Or right. Uh, uh, but yeah, that seemed very interesting. Sadly, I couldn't come. <laughs> but... Oh, later, uh, Juan also invited Urs. Urs yeah. In category seminar Unam, there is there is also uh, I mean this is how we met. <laughs> Oh, I There's also that. a seminar group and uh, they, they are doing very nice seminars. So yeah, we've been doing this online seminar for uh, almost two years, I think, year and a half since the yeah. pandemic started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been a bit, I know how challenge uh, so it's been the organizers are we're three organizers, but one of the two of the three organizers don't do well. It's actually very busy, so it's two of us, and so I know how much work it is to <laughs> organize something like this, even if it's online. So yeah. Okay, maybe we can introduce now or what you like. Yeah. Uh, so uh, today uh, our speaker speaker is uh, Juan Orendine from uh, Nation National Autom Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, Juan uh, obtained his PhD from uh, UNAM and uh, his main area of interest is category theory uh, and its applications on quantum field theory, uh, conformant field theory, gauge theory, 
uh, and information theory, also operator algebras and representation theory. And uh, today uh, he will give us a talk about higher lattice gauge fields and cubical omega group fields. So uh, it's all yours, Juan. Thank you uh, for accepting our invitation. Yeah, thank you very much, Akif, and thank you very much for the organizers for giving me the chance to give this talk. Uh, let me share my screen just very quickly. Um, can you see? Can you see my screen here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is good. <laughs> Okay, so the as Akif mentioned, uh, the title of the talk is Higher Lattice Gauge Fields and Homotopy Cubicle Omega Groupoids. So this is joint work with a colleague at UNAM at the National University of Mexico, Jose Antonio Zapata. He's a physicist. This is, uh, I should warn you that this is work in progress. So we're, uh, right now we're finishing writing our first preprint on this. So we've been working on this for uh, about a year. I'm not a physicist, uh, he is. So it was a bit difficult to sort of um, uh, agree on what we had to do, right, uh, what we're interested in. But uh, in the end, I think we got something uh, interesting. <laughs> so um, so again, I'd like to think, uh, uh, I'd like to warn you that this is a work in progress. Uh, so I'll be a little bit um, informal with a couple of things. Um, but yeah, uh, if, if, if anyone wishes to ask me a question or interrupt me during the talk, please do so. So it, it's, I feel like it's better to be interrupted so that you don't feel like you're talking to yourself. <laughs> so, okay, so the plan for the talk is the following. So I'll start with a brief review on uh, gauge fields. Uh, then I'll talk about two dimensional gauge fields. Then I'll say a few things about cubical omega groupoids, and I'll end with our definition and a few comments on it on uh, higher gauge fields, uh, higher lattice gauge fields. Uh, so very, very briefly, um, uh, gauge theory uh, is a type of field theory in which the Lagrangian of the theory and hence the dynamics of the system itself is invariant under uh, some sort of local transformations, which are usually parametrized smoothly by a Lie group, which we call the gauge group of the theory. Um, this sort of theory, gauge theory, uh, provides a way of speaking of equations whose solutions are physically meaningful. To these are the so-called gauge theoretic equations of uh, the theory. So mathematically, uh, we study gauge uh, theories um, through uh, the study of connections and principal vector of fiber, fiber bundles. Uh, some examples of mathematical gauge theories are some classical examples are Yang Mills theory, where the gauge group is SUN, and Chern Simon's theory on a Lie group G, where the gauge group is the group G, of course. Uh, so there is this sort of two worlds in gauge theory. There's the physics world and the physics world and the mathematics world. And, and within the mathematics world, there's two worlds. There's the geometry world and there's the algebraic or categorical world. So I'll talk about the algebraic world a little bit later, but for now uh, we have uh, a dictionary between the concepts that physicists study and uh, mathematicians study when studying a, a gauge theory. So, um, so the basic data of a, of a gauge theory is for physicists, uh, what they call an instanton or a charge sector, which for mathematicians is a principal bundle. So we usually start with the principal bundle. We call the structure group, the gauge group of the theory. Um, we call local trivializations of the, of the principal bundle uh, gauge. Uh, changes of local trivializations, uh, we call local gauge transformations. Uh, we study, if, we, if we're on the setup, if we start with, if we have a, 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 a principal bundle, uh, we study connections on the principal bundle. We call this in physics gauge fields. Uh, and we can derive some things about this gauge fields. Uh, the main thing that we can derive from them is the gauge field strength, uh, which is the curva curvature of the connection. So for us, um, if, if, if you're a mathematician and you study gauge, gauge theory uh, in this geometric picture, then you study, you start with a principal bundle. Uh, you usually trivialize it uh, to study it uh, as a trivial bundle. And you study uh, a few things. You start with a connection. And then you study uh, 
uh, local trivialization, sorry, changes of local trivializations and, and how uh, the quantities derived from this connection change um, uh, along the uh, changes of local trivializations. And then you derive things like the curvature and so on, and you study these things. Um, we want to study uh, so-called algebraic gauge theory, which is sort of a counterpart to this geometric picture. Uh, there are some basic ingredients for algebraic gauge theory, which I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, gauge theory is a smooth theory, um, but uh, the uh, ingredients for the algebraic picture have a topological, um, topological version, which are more uh, natural and I think uh, better known for the audience of the seminar. So I'll talk about, uh, I'll briefly recall those ingredients and then I'll pass through, I'll pass to the smooth versions of them. So the first ingredient is the fundamental groupoid of a topological space. So suppose X is a topological space, then the fundamental groupoid of X, pi one of X, uh, is a groupoid that has points of X objects. And uh, if X and Y are elements of X, points of X are objects and pi one of X, then the morphisms from X to Y and pi one of X are the homotopy equivalences relative to endpoints of continuous paths gamma on X starting on point X and ending at point Y. So the composition of paths or morphisms is the usual concatenation of paths, identities or constant paths, and uh, inverses, which I didn't write here, is the orientation change on paths. This is all well-defined up to homotopies. Uh, and so this gives us a groupoid. So this groupoid is in a sense, the categorification of the uh, fundamental groupoids of, uh, of the of the space on the points in their in its components. So in the sense that if we have a point X in our space X, big X, then the group the group of automorphisms or loops of the point X and the groupoid pi one of X is the uh, fundamental groupoid of X based on the point X. So geometrically, we'll start with a topological space X. We'll picture it like this. Uh, just a, a ball, a, a cylinder, a, a ball with a with a with a with a hole in it. So the points, the the objects of the of the fundamental groupoid of X are points of X. Oh, sorry, I wanted to draw these red. Uh, so we have red points here. So points of X. Morphisms are paths, continuous paths, in X from this point in the left to this point in the right. So uh, if we have two paths such that there is a homotopy from this path uh, on the top to the path in the bottom, then the two paths are account for the same information in the, in the fundam fundamental groupoid. And if we have another path here on the bottom uh, where there's no homotopy from the paths in the top to the path in the bottom, then this another path is some different piece of data. So we have an obvious composition, which is concatenating paths, which is drawn like this. So if we have a path here uh, and a path here, then the composition is just a concatenation. The uh, inverses, again, is just changing tips of arrows. And the identity on a, on a red point is just considering the trivial path on that red point. So that's the geometric picture of the fundamental groupoid of a topological space X, which I assume that everyone in the audience knows very well. So another, um, so that's the topological version of the first uh, piece of structure that we need to study, um, algebraic gauge fields. The other piece of structure is also a very well-known construction, which is the looping groupoid construction. So if G is a group, then we write BG for the groupoid with a single object, which uh, we write as star, um, uh, and such that the automorphism group of the single object star on the uh, group with BG is the group G. So composition is the product of G. The identity here is the identity element of G and the inverses are the inverses in, in, in the group G. So again, we call this the looping group void of G. Geometrically, we draw this like this. So we have a single point and we have arrows, which now we draw as loops from that point to itself. And these are parameterized by elements of G. So if we have another loop here, let's say, this, and so this is parameterized by an element H. Then the composition of the loop G followed by the loop H is a new loop, uh, which we just parameterize by uh, GH, um, uh, where the product is in G. Uh, if we have, um, let's say, a loop uh, D 
D again here. Um, then its symbols, uh, which we write like this, is actually just uh, the loop uh, parameterized by G with opposite orientation. And so that's the geometric picture of this, uh, the looping group weight uh, of a group. So those are sort of like the bare bones uh, components of uh, algebraic H uh, theory. So we have the fundamental group weight of a topological space and the, the looping group weight of a group G. So these are very important constructions. Of course, the, the looping group weight of a group G is in a sense the uh, classifying space of the group. Uh, the, we can extract a lot of things or, or the information of the group G from this uh, groupoid. Uh, for, for example, uh, the category of pre-sheaves, co-pre-sheaves on, the, on, on the, the looping groupoid of a group G is the category of representations of G and so on and so forth. So yeah, okay. But again, uh, gauge theory uh, is concerned with uh, connections and smooth, of course, smooth principal bundles. It's concerned with smooth things. So if we want to have an algebraic picture involving this constructions of the fundamental groupoid and the, uh, the looping groupoid um, uh, capturing some information about uh, what we understand for gauge theory, then we should have uh, smooth versions of these constructions. So the smooth version of the fundamental groupoid construction is what is known as the path groupoid construction. So this, this is as follows. So we should start with uh, not a topological space, a smooth manifold. So a smooth path gamma uh, in a smooth manifold X is called a lazy path if gamma is constant in a neighborhood of uh, zero and one. So observe that lazy paths are closed under concatenation, uh, contain all constant paths and contain all uh, inverses. So a smooth path uh, is lazy if it just takes a while to start and it just stops before finishing. So it's really lazy. <laughs> So if gamma and gamma prime are lazy paths in a, in a smooth manifold X and H is a homotopy relative to endpoints from gamma to gamma prime, then we'll say that gamma H is a thin homotopy if H of course is smooth and uh, the rank of the derivative of H on any point of the square is less than two for every yeah, point in the square. So uh, if we have two lazy uh, paths on a smooth manifold X, then a thin homotopy is just a smooth homotopy relative to endpoints um, such that uh, it, it is degenerate. So it doesn't sweep uh, any surfaces. Uh, so um, this relation of being uh, equivalent up to thin homotopies is an equivalence relation on lazy paths on uh, smooth manifolds. We write this uh, like this. Uh, and so, yeah, we consider equivalence uh, classes of lazy paths on smooth manifolds up to um, thin homotopies, thin uh, smooth homotopies. So it turns out that this is again a groupoid. So we write P1 of X for this groupoid. So this P1 of X has objects, points of our smooth manifold X, and morphisms are now thin homotopy equivalences of lazy paths on X. So we call P1 of X the path groupoid of X. And so we want to think of this as a smooth version of the fundamental groupoid of uh, smooth manifold X. Uh, okay, now if we now that we define the uh, path groupoid of a, of a smooth manifold, now we can define what we understand for algebraic gauge fields. So write M infinity for the category of smooth manifolds and smooth functions. If X is a smooth manifold, then uh, the path groupoid of X is actually a groupoid internal to uh, M infinity to smooth manifolds. So this means that the uh, set of points or objects is a smooth manifold. The uh, set of morphisms is actually a smooth manifold and all the structure functions are smooth functions. So again, this is a smooth, we call, this, so this is, th this is a groupoid internal to M infinity. We call these smooth groupoids. Now observe that if G is not just a group, but a leak group, then the, the looping groupoid BG of G is also a groupoid internal to M infinity. So this has a single object. So this is the single point manifold and uh, the category, the collection of morphisms is G, which is a Lie group, so a smooth manifold. So this is a groupoid internal to M infinity. So again, smooth groupoid. So uh, if we have uh, X, a smooth manifold and G, a Lie group, then the path groupoid of X is a smooth groupoid 
the, the looping groupoid of G, this is smooth groupoid. And then what well, we can consider uh, internal uh, functors between these two things, internal to the category of smooth manifolds. So we call this smooth functors. So uh, smooth groupoids and smooth functors form a category, which you write like this, GPDM infinity. And so, yeah, we our notion of gauge field or algebraic gauge field lives in this category. So we have the following theorem uh, proven in this reference uh, by Bias and Werka. So the theorem says that if G is a Lie group, X is a smooth manifold, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between one connections omega and the trivial principal bundle X with structure group G. Uh, G valued one from say on X, where G is the Lie algebra of G. And uh, very importantly for us, smooth functors uh, from the path group point of X to the, the looping group point of G. So write this as whole because this describe a sort of generalized or not in this case not generalized. This describe this describes holonomy of paths um, in the base uh, manifold X. So what this theorem says is that we can exchange connections and trivial principal bundles on a base X with um, with structure group Lie group G for uh, this sort of uh, algebraic or uh, categorical objects, functors from the path group point of X to the, the looping group point of G, assuming that these are uh, smooth, these are internal to the category of smooth manifolds. So yeah, again, uh, for us, algebraic, well, well sort, of, sort of mathematical or geometric uh, gauge theory studies connections on uh, principal bundles, uh, if we just don't concern ourselves with uh, gauge transformations for the moment. So we just consider uh, trivial principal bundles, then we consider connections and trivial principal bundles. And so we can just forget about this geometric picture and just study functors from uh, smooth functors from this path groupoid to this the looping groupoid. Um, so yeah, that's really nice and interesting if you're interested in category theory, of course, if you study groupoids there, or if you're in a higher structures uh, seminar. But what is the use of this? Why do we care about this in gauge theory? Well, so this, of course, lends itself to lots of generalizations, lots of very interesting generalizations. So one of the most important uh, ones is lattice gauge uh, theory. So lattice gauge, uh, lattice gauge field is the same thing as a gauge field. So um, where the base space X now has been discretized, this, it's been substituted by a combinatorial object. This is in the physics literature usually taken to be a triangulation of your base manifold X. And so one usually uh, starts with a principal bundle with base X, uh, considers a triangulation of X, forgets about X, and just thinks about this triangulation. Um, yeah, so forget about the manifold X, keep the triangulation T. So this is just a, a one dimensional simplicial set. Well, it's a simplicial set, but we just consider parallel transport along curves in the uh, one skeleton over uh, simplicial set T. So uh, I'm sorry, before I didn't stress this enough, I think. So uh, item three that we're focusing on, this, th this just says that a connection of, on a trivial principal bundle is just the same thing as describing uh, parallel transport along that connection uh, compositionally. So we're focusing on parallel transport and its compositional uh, properties. Uh, okay, so in lattice gauge, in, in, in lattice gauge theory, uh, so we again consider just parallel transport along curves in the one skeleton of a simplicial set T, which we think that is uh, the 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 it's it's a track forms a triangulation of the base uh, manifold of a principal bundle, something that looks like this. <laughs> um, so now we, uh, if we consider um, parallel transport along curves. Uh, in the one skeleton of our simplicial set, but then we only need to consider its one dimensional skeleton. So in general, we just, in usual lattice gauge fields, uh, field theory, we just consider one dimensional simplicial sets. Now a one dimensional simplicial set is essentially the same thing as a directed graph. So a directed graph is a pair V comma E, uh, where E is a set of edges and V is a set of vertices and a pair of functions of source and target from the set of uh, edges to the set of vertices. So this is this thing here. So we have a bunch of red points, which are our vertices. We have a bunch of uh, black arrows, which are our edges. And so we have a bunch of um, tips of arrows uh, pointing to different points that tell us what the source and target of each arrow are. Uh, 
Okay, now what do we do? So suppose we have a one-dimensional simplicial set, a directed graph for a one-dimensional lattice, T, which we write as VE, and we include S and T. Uh, we can associate to this thing uh, a groupoid, CT. So the objects of this groupoid CT are the elements of B, are the vertices of our one-dimensional simplicial set. And morphisms are sequences of this form, EK, to the epsilon k, et cetera, to E1 to the epsilon 1, where EI are edges of our, um, of our one-dimensional simplicial set or a directed graph. Uh, the epsilon i's are either 1 or minus 1. And we have this, uh, um, this, this extended source and target functions uh, on, this, on, on our edges with a minus 1 on top. And we assume that the E1s and EKs are compatible with this extended source and target. Uh, functions. So you have this equation here. And so, <clears throat> so we consider these words on, on, on edges and we divide modulo the minimal equivalence relation making concatenation associative and making uh, the function associating to every edge its inverse, its uh, edge with opposite orientation uh, provide inverses. Uh, so this, this provides this set CT, this pair of sets CT with the structure of a groupoid uh, this is called. This is actually the free group we generated by this one-dimensional simplicial set. Uh, so examples of things we can do on this free group we generated by T are the following. So suppose we have this one-dimensional simplicial set. Uh, we call this E1, E2, and E3. These paths. So we can consider paths that look like this. So I wrote here E1, E2. So we can consider this word here. So E1, E2. Then we can consider E2. Uh, E3, E2 inverse, so we can consider E3, and then we can compose with E2 with, with, or with its orientation reverse, so E2. We can consider E1, E2, so this green path, uh, followed by the blue path. Uh, oh, sorry, I think this should be E3 inverse E2. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we can compose the green path with the inverse of the blue path. And uh, we can also consider, for example, E3 followed by the inverse of E2 and then followed by E2, and this would be equal to E3 and things like that. So th those are the things that we can consider on the free uh, group point generated by a simplicial set that sort of looks like this one dimensional simplicial set. Okay, so again, what we're doing here is that we're uh, substituting, so we started with this uh, geometric notion of what a gauge field is. Then we saw that we can, so Bayes and Huerta told us that we can substitute that data with this sort of algebraic version of parallel transport with a functor from the path groupoid of the base space to the, the looping groupoid of our uh, structure group. And so in lattice gauge theory, we want that same situation just uh, when our space, base space is a discrete thing, a simplicial set of dimension one that sort of reflects uh, a sort of a manifold. So we're trying to emulate the construction of the path groupoid or the fundamental groupoid of a topological space um, through this, uh, in this case of a simplicial set. Uh, okay, so now, so we have the following definition. If T is a one-dimensional simplicial set, a directed graph or a one-dimensional lattice, B, E, S, and T, and G is a Lie group, then a lattice gauge field on T with gauge group G is a functor, uh, a usual functor of groupoids Hall from the free groupoid generated by T to the looping groupoid generated by G. So again, this describes a sort of uh, holonomy, the holonomy of a connection of, of the trivial uh, principal bundle on some sort of manifold that sort of generates our triangulation T with structure group G. And so this allows us to speak of gauge transformations and gauge invariants. If we're concerned about this, uh, we're not in the stuff uh, on this discrete uh, case. So what is what does a lattice gauge field do? So suppose we're in the in the setting of our definition. So to every sequence gamma of edges in our one dimensional simplicial set T or discrete path on T. So we have a holonomy on that discrete path gamma, which is an element of G. So we have some sort of path like this. Um, let's say 
the path, green path that we considered before, then the holonomy of that path is just a loop here. It's an element in G. Um, okay, uh, and not just that, but if we consider something like we did before, so we consider the green path, and then we consider a blue path that we can compose this, oh, sorry, this green path with, let's say something like this. Uh, well, it's different than what I did before. So suppose we consider the green path composed by the um, uh, blue path. So this would be gamma, this would be gamma prime. Then the holonomy of gamma concatenated by gamma prime would be uh, the product of uh, the holonomy of gamma and the holonomy of gamma prime. So the concatenation of geometric paths in this the looping groupoid of our base group. And the same thing would happen with uh, inverting orientation. If we had this green path here, uh, the holonomy of this is again a path here. Oh, sorry, a path here. <laughs> and uh, so inverting the orientation of the green path in our simplicial set would be tantamount to inverting the orientation of our loop in the, the looping groupoid of G. Um, so that, that, that's what lattice gauge field theory does. Uh, so it just starts with some uh, basic data, which is a one-dimensional simplicial set or a directed graph or one-dimensional lattice. There's, that's the one piece of data that we have. Then we also have a gauge group, so a Lie group G. And so what we do is we consider holonomies or parallel transport of the street paths in our uh, one-dimensional simplicial set on our uh, on our gauge group. Um, so this is again the function that associates to every path loop on the uh, the looping groupoid of G uh, in such a way that if we have a composite path, then this amounts to uh, multiplying the 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 corresponding holonomies. If we have a path, then reverting orientation amounts to reverting the orientation of our uh, loops in the, the looping groupoid and taking the trivial um, uh, this pretty path amounts to taking the trivial loop on our, uh, the looping group. Lead. Okay, so if we can summarize this as a functor from the uh, free group point generated by our one dimensional lattice to the, um, the looping group point of our group G. So, yeah, this is classic one dimensional gauge theory. Again, so the point here is that on the one hand, we study connections and principal bundles. We can uh, substitute that by um, holonomies or parallel transport with compositionality uh, or functors or, uh, between path groupoids from path groupoids to the looping groupoids. We can translate that to a discrete uh, setting where we consider uh, discrete paths um, and we consider their holonomies to the, the looping groupoid of our uh, gauge group. So uh, the idea of studying lattice gauge uh, fields is that uh, so get usual gauge fields are not very nice theoretical things, but uh, it's very difficult to compute things on them on the computer to make actual predictions on them. So what physicists do is they uh, approximate them through some sort of uh, discrete thing, so, so by a one-dimensional simplicial set, and then uh, they compute things on that one-dimensional simplicial set, and they assume that those things that they compute uh, sort of approximate the continuous picture. Um, so yeah, now, uh, okay, so that's gauge field. Now we consider two dimensional gauge, gauge fields. So gauge fields describe parallel transport of points along paths as we saw. Now two, uh, two, -dimensional, um, two dimensional gauge theory describes uh, parallel transport of paths uh, and points, uh, not just along paths, but along uh, surfaces. So it describes, so, uh, uh, gauge fields, if, if you have a gauge field, you have a connection, and if you have two points and you have a path, then you have a holonomy, and that is so that, that, that gives you information about your, your field. Now, suppose, so that's a one-dimensional structure. Suppose you have, you're losing information, you're in a situation where there's some information of your connection uh, when considering parallel transport along uh, of, uh, let's say, string, um, uh, string particles, string-like particles along uh, surfaces or more uh, higher dimensional things along higher dimensional things. So this is not described by uh, gauge theory as I described it before. 
So if we want to consider those things, we need a higher version of the path groupoid for starters. So A2 groupoid is A2 category where every cell is strictly invertible in all possible directions. So in A2 category, we have objects, we have uh, morphisms or one cells, and we have morphisms between morphisms or two cells. And we have two compositions, one horizontal and one vertical. So, and we have a usual composition or horizontal composition between one cells. So A2 groupoid is A2 category where every one cell is invertible with respect to this horizontal composition and where every two cell is invertible with respect to vertical and horizontal compositions. Um, okay, so we want a two-dimensional version of the path groupoid or the fundamental groupoid of a topological space. And so we, of course, if we want a higher version of the path groupoid, we need a higher version of the lazy path of, of lazy paths. So suppose X is a smooth manifold, suppose gamma and gamma prime are paths or lazy paths uh, in X, uh, starting and ending at, in the same point. And suppose H uh, is a smooth homotopy relative to endpoints uh, in X from gamma to gamma prime. Then we say that H is a, a lazy two path from gamma to gamma prime. If H is independent of S near S, equals to zero and s equals to one, and h is independent, h s comma t is independent of t near t equals zero and t equals one. So uh, suppose we're in our space x, in our manifold x, and so we have our paths gamma and gamma prime, and we have our homotopy um, h, which is this uh, blue thing between the green paths gamma and gamma prime. Uh, suppose gamma and gamma prime are, are lazy, and then h is lazy if h is independent, the value of H is independent in a neighborhood here. It's independent of, of, of H in a neighborhood in the bottom and is independent of H in a neighborhood of this left and right par uh, parts. So yeah, it's basically a straightforward generalization of what a lazy path is. So we consider lazy two paths between lazy one paths. Uh, okay, now what is the path two groupoid? So suppose X is a smooth manifold and we write P2 of X for the path group point of X. Yes. Uh, what do we lose if we just choose constant around, I mean, uh, around the uh, square? Uh, I mean, instead of uh, uh, separate, I mean, is it too lazy? <laughs> <laughs> We just choose constant. I mean, instead of independent of S or independent of T, saying separately, can we say constant? Or uh, uh, well, I'm not sure. We, do I'm we not lose sure about, a lot of things there? I'm not sure about that. I would imagine, to be honest, I don't know, but I would imagine it's the same thing. So uh, same thing. So yeah, I would imagine every 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 lazy path can be converted or refined or something exchange up to homotopies, higher oh, homotopies, okay. dimensional mm -hmm. homotopies. To, so you're thinking about something like this. So what I said is you have your square here. And so what I'm saying is this is uh, constant in the neighborhood here and in the neighborhood here. And it's constant in a neighborhood here and in a neighborhood here, right? And so the question is, why not consider just the neighborhood of the whole boundary and say it's constant in this neighborhood? Uh, yeah, but you say not constant, but independent of S and T. Independent, yeah, well, yeah, independent. Does it mean constant? Uh, I don't know. I mean. No, no, independent, yeah, I'm sorry. That was, I misspoke. I will, uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, so thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the question. I, I'm not sure, but I would imagine it's the same thing of the form of the piece. Okay. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, so. So, okay, so this is our choice of uh, lazy, lazy two paths between, between, two, between lazy paths. So of course, yeah, there's, there, that's, one, that's one thing, that's one little bite of how one thing is very, very simple and easy to understand in dimension one. Uh, there is a, some, some sort of very clear path on extending to dimension two, uh, as I said here, as uh, Bias and Schreiber do it. But of course, there's always subtleties and things, other options, which are exactly as natural as the ones we consider uh, in dimension two so here. <laughs> so, okay, well, so um, so this is the path to groupoid of a smooth manifold. So suppose X is a smooth manifold. 
So P2 of X is the path to group point of X. So this is a two group point defined as follows. So the objects are again points of X. The one cells are a thin homotopy equivalence of lazy paths of X. Uh, two cells are a thin homotopy equivalences of lazy two paths on X. Composition is horizontal and vertical concatenations and identities are constant lazy one dimensional two dimensional paths. And of course, uh, 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 horizontal and vertical index uh, inverses are provided by inverting uh, vertical or horizontal orientation. So P2 of X is a two group point internal to smooth manifolds. That's a smooth two group point. Uh, and uh, the kinds of things that we can do on P2 of X are essentially things like this. So we have objects, which are the red dots here. Uh, we have paths, which are uh, homoto thin homotopy equivalences of lazy paths. And we have this blue fillers between them, these two cells between them, which are now uh, uh, lazy two paths between the green things, uh, or homo uh, so I'm sorry, thin homotopy equivalences of uh, lazy two paths between the green things. Uh, and we can compose these things uh, in arrangements are, as are drawn here. We can compose them vertically, concatenate them vertically. We can concatenate them uh, horizontally. And, uh, and, and we can invert the orientations of those compositions. And then we can also consider trivial uh, one and two dimensional paths horizontally in, two di in dimensions two uh, horizontally and vertically. So, Basically, this is the picture that we consider for the path to groupoid over smooth manifold X. Uh, okay, so that's one piece of data that we need to define two dimensional uh, gauge fields or uh, two dimensional parallel transport or two dimensional holonomies. So, a two group, uh, the second uh, piece that we need, of course, is two groups or a higher version or a two dimensional version of, uh, of the looping groupoid of a group. So a two group is a group word internal to the category of groups GP. A Lee two group word is a group word internal to the category of Lee groups G. So this is just uh, a group word internal, a group void where the collection of objects is a Lee group and the collection of morphisms is a Lee group and the uh, structure functions are actually morphisms of Lee groups. So a Lee two group is a Lee group of objects G zero, a Lee group of morphisms G one, a domain and codomain uh, Lee smooth morphisms S and T from the Lee group of morphisms G1 to the Lee group of objects G0, a smooth morphism of composition from the fiber product of G1 and G1 uh, fiber by G0 to G1, and a smooth inversion morphism from G1 to G1. So let's find the usual conditions for the data of a group of uh, so this is sort of the easy definition of what a Lee group is. There's, uh, sorry, of a two Lee two group. There's uh, some equivalent definitions. Uh, one that we're going to use is that every Lee two group defines a smooth two groupoid with single object, which we call star. So essentially, the way we want to think about two groups or Lee two groups are things like this. So we have a single object star, as we did with the looping group groupoid of a of a Lee group, and we have green paths or green loops as we did before. But now we have fillers between the between the the, the green loops, uh, which we think of two dimensional um, uh, two dimensional loops between the one dimensional loops. Uh, what operations can we do with this uh, two dimensional loops? Well, if we have uh, if we have an arrangement like this, so if we have three green loops, one dimensional loops, we have a two dimensional two dimensional uh, blue loop, and we have a, a an orange two dimensional uh, loop and these two can be concatenating, concatenated um, from top to bottom. Then we can we have a concatenation operation between them, and so this would be a two-dimensional loop. I'm sorry. So uh, the composition of these two uh, would be a two-dimensional loop from this uh, one-dimensional loop to this one-dimensional loop. And uh, the other operation that we have is uh, horizontal concatenation. So suppose we, we are in the following situation. So we have now an arrangement of four uh, green loops um, and we have an orange loop here. We have some sort of empty hole here and we have a blue loop, a blue two dimensional loop on top. Then uh, we can compose these two things uh, horizontally in order to get 
a, a two-dimensional loop from the composition of uh, this loop here and this loop here to the composition of this loop here and this loop here. So that's the way we want to we want to think about uh, uh, Lie two groups. So we have a single object star. We have green loops. We have uh, two-dimensional loops, and we have ways of composing uh, the two-dimensional loops vertically and horizontally in a way compatible with the uh, composition operation and one-dimensional loops. Um, okay, and all that uh, is uh, smoothly parametrized, so that's internal to um, to to smooth manifolds. Okay, so now we have the uh, two-dimensional path grouplet of a smooth manifold. We have this notion of a smooth two group. And now we can define uh, two dimensional gauge fields. So suppose X is a smooth manifold. Suppose G is a lead two group, then a two dimensional gauge field on X uh, with gauge two group uh, G. I'm sorry, I should have written G here. Um, G um, is a smooth functor, smooth two functor whole again from the uh, smooth path two groupoid of X, P2 of X to the smooth two groupoid, uh, smooth uh, gauge two groupoid, uh, two group G. So what does a two-dimensional gauge field do? So it associates points, so objects of our, of our path two groupoid, uh, the single object of our uh, two group. It associates one-dimensional cells to one-dimensional cells to, so lazy paths on our, on our manifold X. Uh, gamma, their holonomy, which is a one cell in or a one loop in our two group, uh, two thin homotopy equivalent paths, uh, let's say gamma and gamma prime is, are associated with the same uh, one loop in G, the comp uh, composite paths in, in composite one dimensional paths in X. This is associated the product of one dimensional loops in G, the inverse one, the one dimensional inverse is associated the one dimensional inverse and the constant path is associated with the identity. So this is the same, the, the one dimensional picture of a uh, two dimensional gauge field is the same thing as we had before uh, with our ordinary gauge field. So I was going to draw the same drawing that I had before here, but maybe that's not worth it. Let's just draw the two dimensional drawing. So apart from this one dimensional data, we have uh, the following data. So uh, 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 a two-dimensional gauge field associates to every lazy two path H from a uh, lazy two lazy one-dimensional paths gamma to gamma prime uh, a holonomy. So a two cell or a two loop from the loop holonomy of gamma to the loop holonomy of gamma prime. Uh, two thin homotopy equivalent two paths. Um, uh, so I should I should I should have written H and H prime here. I'm sorry. H and, whoops, H and H prime. Uh, this associates the same uh, two path, the, the holonomy of these two paths are the same. Uh, this respects vertical composition. So if we have a vertical concatenation of two uh, lazy paths on X, then the corresponding holonomy is the um, uh, vertical concatenation of the two corresponding loops. Uh, the horizontal the, the horizontal composition corresponds to horizontal composition. So if we have two lazy two paths that are horizontally composable, then the holonomy of the horizontal composition is the horizontal concatenation of the corresponding um, um, two loops. And the um, vertical and horizontal inverse two paths correspond to uh, vertical and horizontal inverses. Uh, inverse uh, two loops. So essentially the drawing that we have is the following. So we start with our smooth manifold X. And so we have our red vertices or points on X. We have one dimensional paths, so green paths. And we have this blue things, which are uh, lazy two paths between the green paths. So again, to red vertices, we associate the only vertex of the, the looping or, or the, of our two group point. Uh, to green uh, one-dimensional paths, we associate green one-dimensional loops. And to blue two-dimensional loops, uh, sorry, lazy paths, we associate uh, blue two-dimensional loops between the corresponding uh, uh, one-dimensional loops. So this is compatible again with horizontal and vertical composition as I described before. Uh, so a better expla explanation on how this is defined is in this reference of Bison Schreiber. Um, 
so yeah, this is two-dimensional gauge uh, theory. So this is, is so this essentially describes uh, parallel transport or holonomies of uh, points along uh, along paths and of paths along uh, two-dimensional paths or lazy paths along two-dimensional lazy paths. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Now this can be easily generalized to the lattice uh, case. So. Uh, again, so this algebraic um, description of uh, gauge fields is very easy to generalize if, if you know a little bit about higher structures. So uh, in, in, in dimension one, we substituted our base space of our, of our, of our holonomy functor with a simplicial set of dimension one. So it's pretty clear what we should do now. So we should substitute our base uh, space with a two-dimensional simplicial set, and we should consider uh, and we consider paths uh, between vertices, one-dimensional paths that are contained in the one-dimensional skeleton of our simplicial set, and we consider two paths, which are uh, paths of two cells between uh, this great one-dimensional paths, and this should define a two-dimensional groupoid, and then we should consider functors from this two-dimensional groupoid to some uh, lead two group, which will play the role of our uh, gauge two group. Um, so I might skip most of this. So this is pretty straightforward. So as one dimensional lattice, lattice gauge theory, we substitute the space X with a discrete version of it. Uh, that is a triangulation. And again, we're only considering parallel transport of, um, of discrete paths contained in the one skeleton along uh, discrete two-dimensional paths contained in the two skeleton, so we only consider two-dimensional simplicial sets. Uh, there is a way of associating to every two-dimensional simplicial set a free um, two-groupoid. Uh, this is somewhat technical, but uh, and it's described here, but I'll just skip it. So you do essentially the same thing. So you just consider uh, formal uh, sequences of two cells and uh, and their inverses, and just divide module the uh, equivalence relation that makes everything into a groupoid. And so if you do that, then uh, a two-dimensional uh, lattice gauge field on a two-dimensional simplicial set is just a two-functor from the free two-groupoid generated by your two-dimensional simplicial set into your gauge uh, E2 group. And so this does essentially the same thing that we described before, uh, just substituting our smooth manifold X with um, again, our simplicial set dimension two. Okay, uh, now what do we want to do here? What what is the point of this whole thing? So uh, there is, so this is done up to dimension two. So generalizing this doesn't seem too difficult. Um, but what? Well, this this cubicle. Oh, sorry, this lattice gauge uh, perspective was done by uh, Hendrik Pfeiffer, uh, I think in 03, 06, or something like that, I'm sorry. I don't remember the exact date, but uh, there is no way that no one has written the general version of this, of this uh, higher, uh, higher gauge fields in the, in, in the smooth case or in the, in the lattice case um, explicitly. Uh, I, I wrote it here in a very um, sort of, uh, well, I, I don't want to say easy, but sort of informal way. But uh, the uh, correct definitions are sort of difficult to, to follow. And it's very difficult to know if you're actually, when you're working with this higher dimensional uh, versions of, of holonomies, it's somewhat difficult to know if you're working with a connection of a, on a principal bundle or not. And people want to keep track of that, of course. In the in the in the continuous case, and so you you, you have to consider gerbs, two dimensional gerbs, and so on, and connections on those two gerbs, and that's somewhat difficult. But in the last case, you don't. There's no re real sense in doing that. So um, I am not sure why Schreiber, uh, sorry, Pfeiffer didn't do this. So there was a note on his paper on how to extend his constructions to to arbitrary dimensions, but they uh, uh, they they didn't seem to work. Uh, there is one thing in, in Pfeiffer's construction or in the construction that I mentioned here on lattice gauge fields and lattice gauge two fields that is sort of missing, which is 
uh, thin homotopies. So thin homotopies are very important in gauge theory. And it just considers the uh, free uh, groupoid and the free two groupoid of your simplicial set. And there's no mention of the thin homotopy. So it might be the case. And the intuition is that maybe <laughs> in dimension one and maybe in dimension two sort of uh, thin homotopy sort of kill all the uh, are killed uh, or make everything trivial and then what you get in the end when you consider trivial or uh, continuous paths uh, running along um, along uh, the skeleton of a simplicial set uh, what you get is the free uh, group point or the free two group point on the simplicial set but that is not proven uh, so there seems to be a sort of gap there uh, number one uh, what is the higher or ultimate higher dimensional version of this? Number one and number two in the lattice uh, case, how do we implement or how do how, how do thin homotopies come into the picture? Okay, so what we're doing is we're sort of trying to answer these questions. Uh, my co-author Jose Antonio Zapata has another paper on, on what he calls extended gauge fields, which are uh, the sort of higher version of of lattice gauge fields uh, in the sense of Pfeiffer, but he doesn't consider um, uh, compositional properties. Um, and he proves some very interesting theorems about the fact that he can he can reconstruct a, a up to homotopy, a continuous or a smooth uh, principal bundle from, or a, a connection on a smooth principal bundle from his, um, from his extended gauge fields. Um, so we want to know exactly, uh, apart from those two uh, questions, we wanted to know exactly what was the uh, relation between his construction and Pfeiffer's construction. So um, yeah, so what we want is sort of a general theory of higher lattice gauge fields that sort of runs smoothly and uh, that does not depend on any dimension and sort of captures a compositional version of this extended lattice gauge fields. And uh, we of course want it to be uh, uh, properly categorical. So we, we want we wanted to phrase it in a theory where we know uh, theorems so that we can prove theorems about limits, for example. So we would like to prove that uh, we would like to construct a notion of higher gauge field in such a way that if we take uh, some sort of limit, some sort of can extension of our gauge fields to uh, with respect to geometric realization, then we should get some sort of uh, thing that is close to the, the smooth version of uh, or higher version of the smooth uh, gauge fields of uh, bias and Schreiber and bias and Huerta. So, okay, so the technical side of this whole thing is the cubical omega group or it's sort of non-abelian algebraic topology. Um, okay, maybe I don't have that much time left. And so I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll just, go through this uh, quickly. Um, uh, I'm sure most of you know about cubical sets and cubical omega group hoods rather well, so I don't want to spend my too much time on this. So yeah, as you know, a cubical set is a pre-sheaf on the cubical side cube of integral traces of standard cubes. Um, so a cubical set models the arithmetics of uh, standard cubes, of course. Uh, we have uh, singular cubical sets, which essentially considers it's the, set, it's the cubical analog of the uh, simplicial, simplicial, um, uh, simplicial singular, singular simplicial set on a topological space. We just consider maps from the standard cube on a topological space. That turns out to be a topolog uh, cubical set. Um, we actually consider uh, filtered spaces. Um, and so the, the, the standard cubes are of course filtered spaces with skeletal filtration. And we consider filtered um, continuous maps from uh, uh, standard cubes with the standard filtration to uh, filtered uh, topological spaces. And so that turns out to be very beneficial for us and for uh, the general theory of uh, non-abelian algebraic topology. Um, so uh, it turns out that if you consider um, filtered um, singular cubes, then you can you can have a general notion of a thin homotopy, which is, as I mentioned, very important for us. Um, so yeah, this is just defined in in the very obvious way in terms of uh, the corresponding filtration. The, so the homotopy omega groupoid of a filtered space, the Brown and Higgins homotopy. Omega group of the filtered space is just a collection of, or the cubical set 
of uh, singular cubes on the space, uh, on the on the filtered space, modulo this notion of uh, thin homotopy, and it turns out to be a cubical omega groupoid. Um, yeah, so a cubical omega groupoid is just a cubical set with operations in such a way that all the operations in all directions are groupoids, and you have an extreme relation. Um, yeah, so. Uh, okay, so that's a cubical omega groupoid, and as I mentioned before, uh, there is a homotopy cubical omega groupoid on a filtered topological space, which again is the cubical set of singular um, cubical uh, singular cubical uh, singular cubes <laughs> on the filtered topological space, or filtered singular cubes on your filtered topological space with respect to the filtration standard filtration under standard uh, cubes. So uh, there is a very big upshot to this construction, which is a higher, the higher cipher van Kampen theorem, which is very important for us if we're trying to reconstruct uh, um, uh, smooth uh, gauge fields from, from discrete or lattice gauge fields, of course. So yeah, this construction, as you know, is very sort of, sort of very involved and difficult and the um, termination of this construction took maybe like 20 or more years by Brown and his collaborators. And it's, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful pieces of math uh, ever constructed. So anyway, okay, so we had a very, <laughs> very quick introduction to uh, cubical omega groupoids and the, and the homotopy cubical omega groupoid of a filtered space. So, okay, so we want to use this to define higher cubical omega, uh, sorry, uh, higher lattice gauge fields. So. Uh, the basic data of a higher lattice gauge field should be a lattice, which should be a simplicial set of arbitrary or possibly infinite dimension, uh, gauge higher group. Uh, so in dimension in dimension one, our uh, gauge groups were Lie groups. In dimension two, were Lie two groups. So we need a higher version of this, arbitrary dimension version of this. And of course, we want a notion of parallel transport, which is something associated uh, associating to higher paths in our simplicial set X, uh, only only running through simplices in X in the appropriate dimension in the appropriate skeleton of X. Uh, we want something that associates to that uh, cells in our higher group G, uh, one dimension lower, or well, this is, I didn't explain this, but cells in G of the appropriate dimension, respective compositions and inverses in constant uh, higher paths. Um, there are several ways of going about this. Uh, again, as I mentioned, there, this is not written in the literature, but uh, there's different options as there are different models of what a higher uh, group point should be. So we're choosing the cubicle uh, model. That's, we, we're trying to construct this, uh, a, a cubicle version or a discrete version of the, of the, of the, of the path groupoid by hand. And so the cubical methods are easier for us to, to do this. So, but we can do this globularly or we can do this as a, a, a strict CAN complex and so on. So uh, our conjecture, there's a conjecture that all these possible constructions are all the same. Um, but anyway, we'll describe this, I'll describe this in the cubical setting. Um, okay, so the basic thing here is that the uh, cubicle omega groupoids organize into a category omega groupoids. Uh, if G and G prime are cubicle omega groupoids, then amorphism uh, in cubicle of cubicle omega groupoids from G to G prime is the morphism of cubicle sets. Uh, that is a natural transformation between pre sheaves on the uh, cubicle sites. Um, uh, just respecting all the operations. So or uh, restricting to functors on every instance and every operation on every direction. So this category of omega groupoids uh, is actually a monoidal category with this tensor product. Um, and actually this monoidal structure is closed. So this is actually a closed monoidal structure where the inner homes are defined through what are known as uh, the right path cubical omega groupoids. So suppose K is a cubical omega groupoid, suppose M is an integer, then the right M path cubical omega group point P and K of K is a cubical omega group point defined like this. So this is just the cubical omega group point um, moved to the right M places. So we just consider your um, K cubes to be the M plus K cubes of P. So in P and K, the K cubes are the uh, M plus K cubes in P. 
And the boundary and the degeneracy operations on P and K are just the same as the boundary and degeneracy operations on P M plus K, just uh, forgetting about the first K boundary and degeneracy operations. So if K and K prime are cubical omega groupoids, then the inner hum cubical omega groupoid uh, from K to K prime is the cubical omega groupoid defined like this. So the M cubes are morphisms of cubical omega groupoids from the M path cubical omega groupoid of K to the cubical omega groupoid K prime. And uh, the boundary and degeneracy uh, functions here are sort of the leftover uh, boundary and degeneracy uh, functions on PMK, uh, then composed with morphisms uh, in this internal uh, cubical omega groupoid. Um, okay, now we have the following lemma. So if K is a cubical omega groupoid, then the path uh, cubical omega groupoid P1K of K is a groupoid internal to omega groupoid with operations as follows. So domain and codomain, the zero, uh, the the zero dimensional domain and code uh, sort of boundaries in direction zero and one identity is degeneracy in, di in direction zero. Composition is composition in direction zero and inverses are inverses in dimension zero, in direction zero, I'm sorry. Uh, so if we have a cubical omega groupoid and we consider the one dimensional path cubical omega groupoid that has the structure of a groupoid internal to cubical omega groupoids. So a cubical omega group, uh, which will be the analog of a two group or Li two group or whatever um, in cubical omega groupoids is a group internal to cubical omega groupoids. So cubical omega groupoids are groupoids internal to, again, cubical omega groupoids. If G is a cubical omega group, then we denote as a circle dot the inner operation of, of our cubical omega group. So how do we define uh, cubical omega groups? So one technique here that, that we're very happy about is that if we start with some sort of uh, Lie group, um, but with an extra structure, then the homotopy cubical omega groupoid of that uh, Lie group with that extra structure is actually a uh, cubical omega group. So a filtered Lie group is a sequence of Lie groups uh, such that, let's say, G1, G2, et cetera, such that all the inclusions are closed. So if G is a filtered Lie group, then the uh, homotopy cubical omega groupoid of that filtered space admits the structure of a cubical omega group with inner uh, operation provided by the multiplication on the uh, corresponding term of the filtration. So we're taking cubical omega groups as our notion of um, gauge group in this higher setting, this higher lattice setting. And we can generate uh, these things. We can generate cubical omega groups through uh, filtered Lie groups as uh, homotopy omega groupoids, this filtered uh, uh, groups. So now the final ingredient for our definition is the following. Suppose X is a completion set. Uh, consider the geometric realization of X. Then the geometric realization of X carries the skeletal filtration, of course, coming from uh, the simplicial set X, where the mth uh, term of this filtration is just the geometric realization of the m dimensional skeleton of X. Um, so we can consider the uh, cubical, homotopy cubical omega groupoid of this geometric realization of. Uh, filtered geometric realization of our simplicial set. So we do this. So we have our two ingredients for defining a higher lattice gauge field. So we have, if we have a simplicial set, we can associate to this uh, a cubical omega groupoid. So this is this cubical omega groupoid here. Then we can take the path of cubical omega groupoid to that. That defines a groupoid internal to cubical omega groupoids. That's sort of our base data then we have to consider a gauge, uh, let's say higher uh, group. So this is just a, a, a cubical omega group. And so through that data, we can define what we understand for a had higher lattice gauge field. So suppose X is a simplicial set, suppose G is a cubical omega group, then a lattice gauge field 
on X or higher lattice gauge field on X with gauge omega group uh, G <laughs> is a morphism uh, of uh, internal groupoids to cubical omega groupoids from the path cubical omega groupoid of the homotopy cubical omega groupoid of the geometric filtered geometric realization of X to the cubical omega group uh, G star. Um, yeah, so we can, if we consider our gauge uh, cubical omega group to be the uh, cubical omega group generated by a filtered Lie group, then we call this uh, filtered uh, Lie group G star, then we call this um, higher lattice gauge fields, um, uh, homotopy higher lattice gauge fields. Um, okay, well, uh, so uh, I was planning on, on writing down what uh, higher lattice gauge fields do, but essentially they do essentially what we want. They associate points to a single to the single point on the right. They associate uh, green one-dimensional paths to green one-dimensional loops. Uh, they associate two blue uh, paths between green paths, uh, green two-dimensional loops, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is just packed in a in a sort of efficient way uh, through this construction of uh, Brown of the of the homotopy cubical omega groupoid. So I, I won't do this. Uh, there's I, I was planning on writing a, a couple of questions, but um, yeah, the important thing is this construction here or the philosophy of how to define a gauge theory, a lattice gauge theory, a two-dimensional gauge theory, a two-dimensional lattice gauge theory. Uh, this idea that there's this sort of thing out there, which are, which is called extended extended lattice gauge uh, theory, and how this uh, all these things come together somehow through this uh, cubical um, uh, cubical homotopy theory or strict cubical homotopy theory techniques of Brown, Brown and Higgins. And well, I'm sorry it took me a bit longer to finish, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Any, no, any questions? So, uh, any questions? Uh, I may have a question. Yes. I mean, I'm not sure if I missed that. Uh, but, uh, there was in the beginning, uh, you mentioned uh, there's a correspondence between uh, connections and uh, functors, etc. I mean, the theorem of Myers and uh, Schreiber. Yeah. Ah, yeah. This one. Yeah. Uh, is there a higher dimensional version of this? I mean, does it mean anything? In yeah, there's a, so this is by Bias and Werther. There's a two-dimensional version of this theorem for two-dimensional smooth uh, gauge fields for this notion here. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, here. So this is in Bias Schreiber. Uh, oh, this actually. Is a, okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. They have a they have a very nice. Uh, so this is the reference. So they have a so uh, Bias and Werther. Uh, they just proved their theorem for trivial principal bundles. And uh, Bias and Schreiber actually add uh, gauge transformations. And so uh, changes of trivialization in their theorem. And so this uh, provides some sort of um, cycles, cycle conditions on your uh, connections. And well, connections, of course, are a bit difficult to define in two dimensions, but uh, I don't remember the exact uh, structure uh, mm -hmm. with which there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but there's it's uh, two gerbs with some sort of flat connection condition. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, there is there is a there is a two-dimensional version of this uh, okay. by Bias and Weber. Yep. Uh, it's not this one, but in this paper, you mean, right? Oh, I'm sorry? Uh, you mean in this paper? It's not- Yeah, in this paper here, sorry. In uh, this, in this reference here. <laughs> I guess there. Yeah, it's, it's it's actually a beautiful reference. I highly 
if uh -huh. if anything uh well i should mention this is the first time i gave this talk so that's why i was in part i'm sorry i was so disorganized at the end i try to take a long time to introduce these things uh but uh if anything um one thing I would like you to take away from this is that uh, these are very beautiful papers, uh, this Bison Schreiber. They're, it's a series of papers that they have, and they're very beautifully written, and they have uh, beautiful theorems. So, mm -hmm. Okay, by, by the way, also, you mentioned the smooth uh, group points and uh, in, in, in uh, one-dimensional case. Uh, is it possible to, uh, I mean, don't consider a smooth a manifolds, but you only have smooth spaces instead, or like diffeological spaces? Uh, probably, yes. This yeah. this version of, uh, so what I wrote here was a very simplified version of uh, Bias and Schreiber's results. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you can do it for diffeological spaces. I'm pretty sure you can. Or maybe pre-shift category. I mean, that's the, the yeah, category of pre probably, yeah. Does, does it yeah, make yeah. easier work on uh, uh, it's probably, this one it's or? Probably, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure, but I would say from what I've heard from, from Urs, actually, <laughs> um, yeah, it's probably easier uh, to work on those categories, as long as the theory is so, I mean, well set. Yeah, the manifold smooth category of smooth manifolds is a bad category. That <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are the not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, Bias and Schreiber, I wrote this in, in terms of, uh, I wrote my definition in the stock of smooth uh, groupoid and smooth two groupoid as groupoids and two groupoids in terms of smooth manifolds, which is still true. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, every, smooth groupoid and smooth two groupoid is a groupoid and two groupoid internal to smooth manifolds. But these are actually defined, uh, this can be defined as pre-sheaves on categories of blah, 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 blah. What, what the is that, yeah. yeah, so on, ca on categories of, uh, of Euclidean spaces and you have uh -huh. Lewin functions and so on and so Most forth. And that's a lot, a lot better behaved than this. And that's the way uh, Schreiber and Bias do it. And in, in a simplified way. So I just didn't want to go through that because I wanted to focus on the lattice case. But while this is true, they work on that case in a better behaved category of manifolds mm -hmm. okay. or, or smooth things. I yeah. mean, defining it is something internal to manifolds, I don't know. I mean, that uh, as a, some limit diagram <laughs> will be very difficult. So I, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, well, in this so definition, you, you assume it exists, basically. Uh, OK, uh, you assume it exists. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Whenever well, it exists, limit, I see. Yeah, the limit, the, the limit diagram that you have to consider is the, just the, the pullback. And then you would have to consider a composition of pullbacks and so on and so forth. And so you assume all those exist, and then you get your structure. But then you can prove a lot of theorems. Uh, but in order to uh, uh, present your definition that works, uh, well enough, but yeah. Uh, so what you get is that if you consider smooth groupoids or like stacks over groupoids or stacks over two groupoids and so on, uh, on on a manifold or on on the category of, of Euclidean manifolds, then you do get uh, this um, um, in in the cases that we consider, you do get uh, uh, groupoids and two groupoids internal to smooth manifolds, but the category is not what we hate. Emre has a question, by the way. Emre. Uh, hi, and thank you yes. for uh, seminar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, cubical T complexes are equivalent to cross modules, cross uh, complex over groupoids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But cross module or complex are defined for two types uh, homotopy, but about three types or higher categorical dimension. What's your opinion? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what my opinion is. <laughs> so <laughs> I think uh, model category is a uh, very important case. Uh, maybe 
three times uh, problematic, uh, I told. Oh, uh, yeah, probably. Well, there's the, I mean, yeah, well, this should be an opinion because it's not settled, is it? And we do have the homotopy hypothesis, which, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's a pretty deep question, which I'm not sure how to answer. Uh, uh, yeah, I have no definitive opinion on on what should what sort of structure should capture three types. Um, uh, but I do know there are uh, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, people say it's uh, two comma infinity categories, or is it three mm -hmm. infinity? Uh, and that's basically that's basically the um, as far as I know, the consensus in the higher category theory um, community, but I, I, I'm i not sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. If there is no other question, let's thank Juan again. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, let me stop sharing my screen so you can you can actually see me. Um, okay. Yep. Stop sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry if I had to rush uh, through the end. Again, I. No, I, we uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting and nice talk, actually. Uh, uh, thank you. So, uh, hopefully, we we will listen to you in future face to face. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, yes. Hopefully. Yeah, um, well, of course, you're all invited to, to Mexico and to our seminar as well. So we can have some, that would be actually very nice if we have, we have some talks related to this and other topics and so on. But hopefully, yes, we can meet soon in person, yeah. sooner than later. Than later. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, next time I can, I, can, I can say things, the things that I wanted to say in a more uh, less rushed way. <laughs> uh, I'm stopping the, the recording, by the way. Yes. Okay.